Thank you all very much indeed for, for joining me. I really uh, appreciate giving me your time and um, looking forward to taking you through a little bit of Tanzania. So my name is John Rams Turner and I'm the Sales and Marketing Director for Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda. I've looked through the list of attendees and I think I've met a fair number of you, um, but for those of you I've yet to have the pleasure of meeting, um, I look forward to doing that one day. When I originally did this uh, webinar, we were going to focus on the whole of Tanzania, but having sort of got through the, the presentation, I realized it would be far too long, and I know your time is incredibly valuable. So I'm really going to focus on northern Tanzania today, and then I think we're going to do a separate southern Tanzania um, presentation, of which you will, of course, be uh, emailed about. So the first thing, I know it's not exactly sticking to the rules, but I just want to show you a few East Africa offers that we've got um, across the region. Um, we've got an agent incentive, uh, a $500 gift card for every booking uh, to Kenya or Tanzania worth $10,000 or more. Uh, for Tanzania, that's for travel before the 30th of June booked with the DMC. And for Kenya, that's travel before the end of next year, and that's booked through the DMC or through the Downers Grove office. I will be making sure this presentation is available to you all, so you don't need to scribble down furiously for all the necessary notes. You will get a copy of this. So Tanzania, 50% off the accommodation for Azura Salu and, uh, and Sanctuary Sadani. So the Azura Salu is in the southern part of Tanzania in the Salu Game Reserve, a massive game reserve, absolutely enormous, with, um, with about 110,000 elephants, a really fantastic place. And then three nights at Sanctuary Sadani Safari Lodge, which is located right on the coast of, um, of mainland Tanzania, overlooking the Indian Ocean. And it's the only national park that it is, straddles uh, on the Indian Ocean um, and has four of the big five. So actually quite a unique setting. Really not, a, not, a, not a, an offer I would suggest you take up with, um, with your first timers to East Africa, but certainly for people who've maybe done a safari or two in the, in the past, and this is something quite unique and a little bit different that they may well enjoy. Um, so until 15th of December, all accommodation and transport in Uganda is discounted. And the Uganda Wildlife Authority have discounted gorilla permits from $600 to $350 per person. And that's for the whole month of November 2014. So if you have a few people who are looking for something a little bit different in, uh, between now and the end of the year, then I think Uganda could suit. And then $1,500 per person between the 15th of October and the 15th of December in Kenya. And that's staying at the Fairmont Norfolk in Nairobi. Three nights Larson's Camp in the northern part of Kenya in Samburu, which is a wonderful national park with the Waso Nero River running straight through it. You can see that on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, also, Samburu is a place I've never really gone there and not seen leopard, which is, um, which is a, a, a nice claim to fame. And then ending up at three nights, it's Sanctuary Olanana in the Maasai Mara, again located on the Mara River. Great uh, viewing of hippos and, of course, all the Mara has to offer. Just a brief shout out about our um, brochures that we have out of our U.S. office. They are all available for 2015. If you haven't got yours, please feel free to um, request them through the website, abercrombiekent.com. That's www.abercrombiekent.com. A little bit of bragging, if I may, seeing as we are talking about Tanzania. Um, the Snows of Kilimanjaro, which is one of our programs on climbing Kilimanjaro, um, was on Good Morning, um, was on the Born to Explore uh, TV program. You can still check out the link there, and I still think that's online. So that's a bit of a, a, a shout out for that. I will come on to our Kilimanjaro climbing operation a little bit later on in this presentation. So, moving straight on. I will mention, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to type them into the questions part of your uh, of the box on the, I'm assuming it's on your right-hand side of your screen. I will get to questions at the end. Um, if I don't get to your question, because there's so many, then we'll make sure everybody gets a personalized email with all the questions being being answered. Okay, so as I said, we're going to focus on the northern part of Tanzania just purely because of the size and scope, and I think we'll do a separate one um, covering 
Gombe, Mahali, Katabi, Ruaha, and the Salu. ANK has offices in Arusha and also at the Ngorogor Crater. Our office at the Crater is more of an operational office. Um, it allows us to repair any vehicles if they need repairing or dispatch vehicles if there's a, a breakdown in Serengeti, for example. It enables us to get a vehicle out there as soon as possible to really um, uh, prevent any, uh, any issues with any impact on the client safaris. I am very pleased to say that we do have breakdowns very, very few and far between. In fact, last year, for the whole of last year, we had nine breakdowns of which four of them the clients never even realized um, because we were able to change the car um, overnight. The peak travel seasons, uh, December through March, which coincides very nicely with um, being chilly in the northern parts of um, the hemisphere, so uh, North America, and then June to September. So you can split Sering um, Tanzania straight into two. So you've got what we call the northern circuit, which includes your iconic Serengetis, your Ngorogoro craters, Lake Manyara and Tarangiri. And then you've got your southern circuit, which is a much, much bigger circuit, covering all the properties that we mentioned there, Gombe Stream National Park, Mahale Mountains, both of which have fantastic chimpanzees. They're both located right on the edge of Lake Tanganyika, which is a really unspoilt wilderness and a stunning, stunning part of the world. Then Katavi, Ruaha, and the Salu. So that's your southern circuit. But as I said, we'll focus on the northern circuit today. So this is a traditional circuit, and what I want to do is I want to just go break it down for you. So this is how a, a northern Tanzania safari circuit looks like. And in each place, we will give you a sort of a, an idea of gold, silver, and bronze accommodation, just to try and put it into perspective for you, um, just to try and make it as easy as possible. So we'll start off with arrival in Kilimanjaro International Airport, which is just to the southeast, mainly east, um, of Arusha. Um, a lot of people have daily flights in there. KLM are probably the most popular one. Um, they have daily flight into Kilimanjaro. So as you can see then, overnight Arusha, which we will cover now, and then they go into, Lake, uh, into Tarangiri National Park to Lake Manyara, Ngorogor Crater, and then into Serengeti. So the red arrows dictate that the clients can do this all on a driving safari in, in our four-wheel drive land cruisers, and then they can fly back to Serengeti. Of course, there is still the option that people can do a flying safari between the various different national parks. So in Arusha, um, we've added a platinum level like Legendary Lodge, because it's, it's an amazing property. It's very small, very boutique located sort of on the outskirts of Arusha, so you don't really get a sense of any of the hustle and, and bustle. And you really do feel like you're on safari already once you arrive there. Same for the Arusha Coffee Lodge, um, 30 units, again located just outside Arusha in a working coffee plantation. Um, so you can still get a chance to see how the, the coffee beans are roasted. So it's a nice little um, sort of excursion, city tour if you like. Aramera River Lodge, Again, a similar sort of concept to the Arusha Coffee Lodge, um, 21 rooms, another, another great property. Again, outside Arusha, so you don't have to worry about too much of the traffic or, or anything else within Arusha itself. Um, or the way we sort of categorize these properties is really based on, on service. Uh, cost, of course, come, plays a part in that. Um, and really how unique they are. There's a number of other options as well, so please don't think these are the only options that we have across the region. And then the last one is the Mount Meru Hotel. It's a very business-orientated hotel. Um, it works very, very well for your one night, your arrival at Kilimanjaro, driving into Arusha, your one night there, and then the next morning you're up breakfast and then you're sort of out on your safari. Um, this is the place that we stay at when we're heading down to Arusha, where we do our board meetings, etc. So it's actually a very, very nice hotel, but doesn't have the uniqueness or the boutiqueness, if you like, if that's such a word, of the other other properties that I mentioned. So after Arusha, head down to Tarangiri National Park. Now Tarangiri is a really understated, underused national park. I love it. It's got um, some two swamps that run permanently. Um, permanently through it that are fed with the waters off uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. It's a two-hour drive on a very good tarmac road, and that tarmac road takes you right the way to the, to the, um, to the gate. 
as I said, the, the water sources there come off Kilimanjaro, and that's mainly the Tarangiri River, and that's year-round, so there's always, always game, especially in the dry season. Um, what I love about the dry season is you get these massive herds of elephants, and they wade straight into the swamps, um, so they can drink and they can cool down, but they also feed, so you sort of see this, this, this swampy area, and it's just got elephants up to their necks, it's absolutely amazing. The other thing I love about Tarangiri is the baobab tree. Now, the baobab tree is, a, is an ancient tree. A lot of the trees in Tarangiri are 3,000 years old. And they are famous for spending 99% of their life without any trees. In fact, um, one of my daughters turned around to me the other day and said that they look like they've been planted upside down because they've got these sort of branches with no leaves on it. And then they flower for uh, a very short period of time and then stunning, absolutely stunning. And traditionally, the long time ago, the poachers used to um, hide in the center of baobab trees because they were hollow, and it was a good way of them staying out of the dry and staying out of um, staying out of the way of the rangers. And the last thing about Tarangiri is you can see what we call the dry country antelope, which I will show you a little bit later on. So that's you can see a baobab tree that has got leaves on it, and um, massive girth of a tr of the tree trunk is absolutely enormous. I just want to go back and show, I'm just looking at my screen here, I don't think everybody got a chance to see that, um, uh, to see that, uh, that picture. There we are, I think, um, I think everybody can see that. I'm going to have to move a little bit slowly, my internet connection down here is not brilliant. So I'm just going to go to a couple of slides showing you what Tarangiri has to offer. Um, so this is Tarangiri sort of towards the end of the, uh, of the dry season. There's still a bit of grass around, um, one, of the, one of the small, one of the small, small streams. But elephants is really what Tarangiri is incredibly well known for. So the next slide is an image of the, one of the swamps. And you can see the elephants are wading on uh, into the... Uh, into the swamp. We've actually got a few hippos on the foreground there having a, having a quick snooze in the sunshine. So this is a very indicative shot of Tarangiri and what you, what you and your clients can expect to see um, when they're in that part of the world. And then we talked about the dry antelopes. So the next slide is a picture of an oryx. Um, oryxes are indigenous to a, a lot of Africa that's incredibly dry. So Namibia, for example, but also northern parts of Kenya um, and into Ethiopia. So what about ter in terms of properties? So we've put out the gold level is Sanctuary Swala, which is um, in the sort of southwestern part of the Tarangiri National Park. And in fact, Tarangiri doesn't have a huge number of properties. So you have really sort of have, to have the feeling of having the whole National Park to yourself. So on the slide here, you can see what I mean by the, um, these old baobab trees that are sort of looking like they've been planted upside down. This is a picture of Sanctuary Swala. On the left-hand side, you can see it's got an um, outdoor shower, which overlooks a watering hole. Fantastic property. The food and service there are, are really very, very good indeed. Um, we very rarely have people coming back not absolutely loving Sanctuary Swala. So on a silver level is Oliver's Camp, which is located on the other side of the swamp to Tarangiri. Um, tented property, very small number of rooms, and again, it's a, it's a great it's a great property. Views almost overlooking the swamp. You don't actually have to go too far to see um, any of the animals in the swamp. And then the last property we've put as a bronze le level is a Maramboy tented camp located just outside Tarangiri National Park, um, but a great camp for people who want to be a bit sensible about, about budget. Um, you can see the plains there. Game in Tarangiri is not too bad. Elephants are the, are the main attraction, but I've been there and I've seen leopards and I've seen lions. There can be tsetse fly problems when the, uh, when the rains come, so we do try and avoid that time of the year, so April, May, when Sanctuary Swaller and Oliver's Camp, for example, are actually closed. And then certain parts of November can depend on, on getting showers in. Um, 
in November. So once clients have done their Lake, uh, their Tarangiri National Park um, sort of starter in um, in their on their safari, then a short drive up to Lake Manyara. Quite often, Lake Manyara is missed out, and if clients have slightly short of time, they can go straight from um, Tarangiri into Ngorongoro Crater. Straightforward, it's an hour and a half. It's a very good road built by the Japanese, completed about five or six years ago and holding up incredibly well. So Lake Manyara is a very small national park, um, famous for tree climbing lions. It's sort of the only lake experience clients are going to get on their, on their safari circuit. They just stick to the northern part of Tanzania. Lots of bird life. We can cycle through um, some villages. There's a place that I call the Banana City, just uh, just near um, Lake Manyara. You can buy a million different types of um, million different types of bananas. So the lake is an alkaline lake, so you get a lot of flamingos at certain times of the year. The game surrounding it is not bad at all. It's not brilliant, but you know we're building the experience up as we go through the circuit, as we end up in in Serengeti. Tree climbing lines is always a uh, a great sight to see. The only other place in East Africa that you can regularly see tree climbing lions is in Ishasha, which is in Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda. So a great experience, and I thoroughly enjoy spending spending time watching these rather large animals climbing trees as if they were young and fit leopards. <clears throat> Sorry, I know it's taking time for these slides to load, so I will um, I will try and match my patter accordingly. So yes, the bird life in in Tarangiri as well as is, is is a in Lake Manyara. Sorry, is is absolutely exceptional. <clears throat> Excuse me. So on the property side of things, um, Lake Manyara Tree Lodge. Um, great views over over the escarpment but it's sort of built in a, in a forest so not everybody gets a fantastic uh, fantastic view but they do have great accommodation um highly recommend if anybody can get clients to stay in lake manyara they definitely definitely should especially if they have the time and it's a must must do So our silver category um, is the Escarpment Luxury Lodge, which has also again, you know, all these properties have amazing views right over the over the escarpment. Now the escarpment actually forms part of the Great Rift Valley, um, so that's a, another another plus point for people to to see. If clients aren't staying at Lake Manyara, then they will be able to see the escarpment as they're driving between Tarangiri and um, Ngorogoro Crater but also they have a fantastic views of, of the escarpment and the various different lakes within the Great Rift Valley as they're flying across. And then the last uh, sort of level of accommodation is the Lake Manyara Serena Safari Lodge. Slightly bigger property than, um, than the others we, um, I just showed you. Um, but again, they all have this fantastic view and, and really the, the, cat, the, the sort of differences are built around a sort of level of exclusivity as well as accommodation um, and service. So once clients have done their Lake Manyara portion, we end up at an iconic, iconic area, the Ngorogoro Crater. It's a very short drive. It's about 45 minutes to the, to the main gate of, um, of the conservation area. So clients can stay at Lake Manyara and do Ngorogoro Crater um, quite, quite uh, simply. There are four permanent lodges but we only use three of them on the crater rim itself um, one of the properties is utterly dreadful and I wouldn't recommend anybody to stay there they also then have um, believe it or not a 75% cancel 75% uh, non-refundable deposit to confirm the room so we definitely don't use those um, so there's you can either stay on the crater rim itself or you stay in Karatu which is about 30 minutes from the um, from the gate and then from the gate, it's a further 30 minutes as you get down onto the crater floor. 
And this is where we generally include our Maasai village visits um, for our um, itineraries on the northern circuit. So the Ngorongoro crater is a really, is a, as I said, an iconic part of the world. Um, huge amounts of wildlife in the uh, in the bottom of the crater. I've been fortunate in, in two separate occasions to see the whole of the big five in 45 minutes, which is a little bit being spoilt, I know, but um, it's such a wonderful place to um, wonderful place to be. Lots of fresh water in the bottom of the um, of, of the crater, which is why you know a lot of vegetation. It means that animals don't really have uh, too many reasons to um, to wander out. So lions, of course, you'll see a plenty. And then if we're really lucky, we get to see the rhinos and they're black rhinos as well, which are indigenous to um, to this part of the world, rather than the um, white rhinos, which are actually originated from southern Africa. And then the Maasai village experience. There are certain parts of the village that can be a little bit uh, over touristified, but we use um, a number of the villages that are located a little bit further away and don't quite get the same amount of traffic. Just so people are aware, Ngorogor Crater has two, two, two roads. So you've got, on the one side, you've got the ascent and descent road, um, which can get a little bit busy in, in, of an evening as um, people coming out. And then on the other side of the crater, further away where Mara and Ngorogoro Sopa is, we have one ascent descent road that that's only used by the, the people staying in the sanctuary Ngorogoro crater camp, which I'll show you in a second, and the Ngorogoro Sopa lodge. Whereas on the other side of the crater, all of the other three main properties and anybody staying at Karatu would have to use separate roads to get down to the bottom of the crater. And as I said, it can get a little bit busy during the sort of peak rush hour, if you like, as people are heading down into the crater in the morning and out of the crater in the evening. So on a sort of gold standard is another iconic uh, sort of image of of northern Tanzania, and that's in Gorgor Crater Lodge. Um, the image on screen is something that the and beyond have been using as a uh, for a number of years, so I just thought I'd, I'd add that in there. But you can see it's built right on the, on, on the lodge itself. It is a fantastic property, as you'd imagine. It comes with a fantastic price tag, of course. But a, a, a fantastic alternative to that would be the Sanctuary in Gorogor Crater Camp. Now, this is a camp that we used to use as a, as a private mobile. So we would go in and set the camp up exclusively for clients. Um, on a sort of as and when basis. What we've done now to try and really lower the price point is set up the camp on a seasonal basis. Um, so there'll be 12, 12 tents set up um, in the peak season. We're fortunate enough with um, Sanctuary and A&K to be the only people allowed to camp on the crater rim itself. Everybody else has to move a little bit further away. It's a great campsite. As I said, it's on the other side of um, of the crater rim itself, which I think is the better side purely because you, you get to see the sun setting, whereas on the other side where you're at Crater Lodge, you have to see the sun rising. And in the morning, it can be incredibly misty, so you, people can miss that. And then on a bronze standard, we've got the other two properties, um, lodges there, and Gorogoro Sopa, um, which I actually prefer, to be honest, to the Serena property. It's, it's large, 97 rooms, it's got fantastic views. Um, and it's great for people who want to stay on the crater rim itself because there are a lot of people who say, no, 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 I'm only going to go there once and I want to stay on the rim. Um, as I said, it has its own ascent descent road that it shares with uh, um, the Sanctuary and Gorogor, um crater camp. So there's far less, far less traffic. And then the other properties, the Ngorogoro Serena, a few less rooms. I always think the building has, looks like it has some sort of disgusting skin disease purely because of all the rocks and, and boulders that they've used to, to decorate the property. Um, but they're both incredibly popular. I would personally choose the Sopa Lodge over the Serena Lodge because of location, but it takes a little bit longer to get there. So what I've done, so that's staying on the crater rim itself. So the next section of properties is at staying at a place called Karatu. Now Karatu is a village about 30 minutes, 35 minutes out from the main gate. It's all beautiful farming property, farming land. 
and you'll see that there's a theme running through these these properties that I'm going to show you. Great alternatives to the properties on the crater rim. Um, I would, if I had a choice, I would stay in this this Karatu area, and this would be my number one choice. I would happily take the extra 45 minutes to an hour, 15 minutes to drive to the crater to the to the crater floor, purely because you've got a lot of other activities here. There's horse riding. These are all work, all of these properties are on working farms, and the scenery here is absolutely stunning. So the Manor and Gorogor Crater, definitely one of my favourites. The service, the food, um, they've got all all their units are built in sort of a an old Dutch colonial style um, uh, building, which I think is fantastic. My second choice would definitely be Gibbs Farm. Um, still a working farm, they grow huge amounts of their own produce. Uh, which I think is absolutely fantastic. They're very happy to show you around the farm, the kitchens, um, and they've got these these great units, absolutely huge, again, right in the heart of farming country. Um, and then moving on to the last property we have, um, going to show you today, is the farmhouse. Again, working farm. This is a slightly larger property. The decor inside, not quite as luxurious as some of the others, but a great property nevertheless, especially for people who are trying to be sensible about budget. Not all of us has the clients as much as we would like to have the you know three thousand three and a half thousand dollars per room per night that the crater lodge charges so if we do have a set of clients that I call you know have what I call real money um, as opposed to totally over the top money, then this is a, a, a fantastic option and really the the, the, the um, experience is not diminished too much at all. So once clients have done their Ngorogoro crater bit, they end up in the Serengeti. The Serengeti is absolutely enormous. It's 10 times the size of the Maasai Mara, just to really put it into perspective for you, or about 15,000 square miles. Four and a half hours on a dirt road, but that road can vary in condition depending upon the season. Once the rains come, um, the road can get a little bit bumpy, but then this is depends upon where the clients are going, and where the clients are going really depends across a, 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 depends on the time of the year and with the animals. So what we try and do is we try and get clients to stay as close to the migration as possible. Of course, that makes utter sense. But if there's no availability, and this does happen, especially in the southern part of Tanzania, availability can be incredibly difficult to get. Um, then Central Serengeti is always a great option. There's lots of permanent water around the whole area, so you're going to see great gain. Um, the visit to Olduvai Gorge is a, is a possible good halfway point for people to see, um, and they can have lunch there. This is Olduvai Gorge is where um, the Leakey family found remains of Matt, the oldest um, human skeleton. So, it's, it's, it's a good halfway point. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't say you need to go to Tanzania and you have to stay there. I'm um, sorry, you have to see that. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting to look at. So a migration map, those of you who I've seen in, in the past will have seen me touting this around for, for many a year, and it's still worth mentioning now. The bottom here, January, February, March, is, is one of the, the key, key times, because this is where we have half a million wildebeest calves born every year. So the migration is 2 million animals strong, about 1.3 million wildebeest and about 700,000 zebra. So location is a fundamental part of choosing the right property for clients. And I would sort of base any ideas on properties around this sort of um, uh, the, the wildebeest migration. So any sort of time between end of June, July, through, right the way through to October, then that northern part of Serengeti is key. Uh, you can see the animals are always bouncing backwards and forwards between the Mara and the Serengeti, really depending on the rainfall. And rainfall can be incredibly localized within this ecosystem. So you can rain in one place and, and 15 miles away, there's nothing at all. And the wildebeest sense this, and they're able to follow where the best and freshest grazing is. So it's an annual event, constantly moving, but there are key times that we need to be a little bit careful of and, and, and a little bit sensible. April, May in the Western Corridor, it does rain quite heavily during that time, so the roads are not in great condition. Same with November, um, but the other times of the year are absolutely perfect.
I just like this image just to remind people that um, we do get some great big cat sightings in Serengeti. Um, ballooning is also available in the northern and central parts of Serengeti, which is fantastic as well. A great experience. I've seen leopard off the back of a uh, of a balloon, and it's um, just amazing to see. They're really, absolutely stunning. Um, elephants, nice herds of elephants, but also I like this image because it really shows you of what the Serengeti is, and it's just wide open plains. Um, in fact, Serengeti means endless place in Ma, the language of the Maasai. So this image was actually taken near the Noru Kopis, uh, which are those little rock formations found scattered throughout um, sort of central and northern part of Serengeti. Um, a lot of rhinos here, a lot of leopard sightings here as well. But um, Tanzania, um, Serengeti, sorry, has also been incredibly uh, well known for its cheetah research, especially in the southern part uh, and also the eastern part of Serengeti. So cheetah research there has been going on there for, for 20, 20, yeah, 20 odd years. So wildebeest migration, I just wanted to show you a couple of images just to refresh your, refresh your memory of what it's like. So here we have some of the plains of um, northern Tanzania, of northern Serengeti, absolutely teeming with wildebeest. Lest we forget, the humble zebra is also a huge, huge part of that. And really, they act as the forerunners for the wildebeest, because they will generally go ahead, slightly ahead of the wildebeest, because they can eat grass that's actually quite long, whereas the wildebeest do eat longer grass, but they sort of prefer it a little bit shorter. But the zebras can, can eat grass, you know, the, it's sort of head height, if you like. So they really are the forerunners for the wildebeest migration. So heading off into the various different camps that we've got in, um, in, in Serengeti. Now, Serengeti is huge. There are a lot of camps there. Not that it's overcrowded in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but what I've done is I've sort of broken the gold, silver, and bronze categories down to northern, and then a separate section of central, and then ending up in the south, just to try and put it into everything into perspective for everybody. So the Singita properties, you know, they've got their Grumeti Reserve, 400,000 hectares to the west of um, Serengeti. So they've got their three properties there that are becoming um, incredibly well known. But they've branched out and they've got the Mara River property, which is located almost on the Kenya border. It's about a mile and a half from the Kenya border. It's in the far north of um, Serengeti. Only six units and beautifully done. I mean, as you would imagine being a Singita, I mean, it's all the bells and whistles and everything that you can imagine. I'm not 100% sure how they keep everything so white, but that's really not something that I have to concern myself with. I just have to enjoy it when I'm there. So that will be a, a gold slash platinum level. So another property that I really enjoy in that northern part of Serengeti is Lamar Courier Hills. It's been open now for about a year, I think, um, and they've, had, they've done incredibly well. Got some fantastic reviews. Each unit, each property has its own, um, own sort of plunge pool. Uh, which is very cleverly done because you're not really allowed to dig deep down. So they've built the uh, plunge pools on the decks so they don't have to change too much of the of the landscape at all, which is fantastic. And then our sort of silver property is the Serengeti bush tops. Um, I mean, this property could be a, a gold level because it's a fantastic property as well, built on stilts, um, very, very large tents, uh, 14 rooms, and located again in that northern part of Serengeti. Now, I haven't put any bronze level in because Northern Serengeti really doesn't have any anything that would be suitable for the North or South American market. There's some properties there that are suitable for Europeans, you know, your German, your French clients, um, but I really don't think for the North Americans and the South Americans that it's actually that suitable at all. So, again, um, a silver level, Lamai Serengeti in the northern uh, northern part of, of, of um, Serengeti. What I love about this property is the views. So I've, I chose this slide just to highlight one of the rooms, but I just wanted to show you that sort of view. And that's an iconic part, you know, iconic image that people have in their mind when they in Tanzania is it's just endless, it constantly. You, you you never feel like you'll ever get to the end. And you actually do get that sense when you're um, when you're driving as well, the sense and scale of, of um, uh, Serengeti is absolutely enormous. 
So moving down into the central part. Now, as I said earlier, central part of Serengeti is great for year-round um, game viewing. There's lots of fresh water in the area, which always, which means that lots of game are going to be um, going to be in that area. Property that I really enjoy is, is the Pioneer Camp, the Serengeti Pioneer Camp. It's sort of south central, if you like. Uh, only ten units. They've done a very nice job with the decor in, in, inside. Um, really, no complaints from me whatsoever. We also have the Serengeti Four Seasons, completely different. It's seventy-two units, so it's actually quite large. Um, but I think it's important we highlight this to clients. Uh, there are people out there who don't want to do the inverted commas tenting all the time. So it's a great way of people to end their safari at Serengeti Four Seasons. They can, you know, play billiards. I think they've got a billiards table in the in the basement. They've got a cigar room. They've got a wine cellar, um, satellite television, and air conditioning. So you can go off on your safari, on your game drives and come back and um, put CNN on or whatever else. Yes, I mean, we don't all necessarily have to agree with that, but that's certainly something that we need to bear in mind because there are clients who do have uh, who do have those requests. On a silver level, we have Namiri Plains, which is in the eastern part of Serengeti. Now, that eastern part of Serengeti was, for 20 years, um, designated as no properties and no game drives because they were doing it for a lot of uh, cheetah conservation and cheetah research. And in July this year, they opened up that area. Um, and the Namiri Plains, um, which is one of, part of the Asilia group, um, they've been tasked with a, a lot of the conservation, but they're also been allowed to build this one small little tented camp with six units. Game driving in that area is fantastic, and you can actually tell that that area has really had not a huge amount of tourist traffic. They've got a lot of skittish game, um, so you, you know it's wildlife that's not that used to seeing vehicles. Um, so they're sort of a little bit wary and a little bit conscious of, of, of the vehicles around them. Um, which I think is fantastic because that's what it's always been like. You know, a hundred years ago, that's what the Serengeti was like. They're not used to having having people in that part of the world, which I think is fantastic. And then just to highlight a sort of a bronze level is the Serengeti Serena with these rather interesting dome-like rooms. Um, they have the suites on top, and then they have the two two rooms underneath. Um, so they have sixty-four rooms, and this is <clears throat> again central Serengeti. So those are the properties in Central, and you know there's a lot of different properties, and, and more and more are being built at, at the time. And I'm not saying that any of these properties are the only ones that they are available, but these are ones that we as ANK know and enjoy and have a great relationship with. But if clients are looking for other things, then please do let us know. We can um, we can create pretty much anything. Okay, so down in the south of Serengeti, which is a key key time for January, February, March, as I mentioned with the wildebeest migration. So Weber Lodge, very similar to your Singita Sasakwa, you know, one of those amazing properties that um, the Grometi have, that Singita have in the, in the Grometi. Um, located in its own little personal 51-acre uh, conservation area that used to be um, under, under um, a hunting concession, but it's now been turned over to purely to conservation. Eight rooms, again, amazing views. Wildebeest migration sort of coming, almost coming underneath your room as you um, as you wake up in the morning. <clears throat> Silver Sanctuary Cassini. Um, this is one of the best places to be in January, February, March. We're sort of taking bookings or Sanctuary taking bookings um, for twenty January, February, March, twenty sixteen. Now, um, just to give you a, a, an example of how in demand this property is. Great location. Um, it's m more of a wilderness-style camp to the sort of luxuriousness of Sanctuary Swala, but again, fantastic location. Really, really highly recommend that as a as a location. And then Sanctuary have their Serengeti Migration Camp. As I mentioned, the Ngorogoro Crater used to have camping on a on a as needs basis. Um, same with our with, within the, within the Serengeti. So what Sanctuary have done is they've created a seasonal camp that will follow the migration through um, south central Serengeti, northern Serengeti. So it'll move on a two, three monthly basis. Again, it'll have 12 units. Um, 
so relatively small. Um, this is an example of one of the um, one of the camps that they will set up. So it's 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 Egyptian cotton sheets, it's rugs on the floor, it's your mosquito net, it's your solar lighting. So these camps are incredibly eco in terms of they don't use any generators, um, or they use some generators, but a lot of it's um, solar powered. Um, and this is sort of another another view and an example of what clients can can get. Um, so a number of different uh, seasonal camp options, uh, and this is this is one of them. So once they've done their Serengeti bit, they can end up uh, taking one and a half hour flight to Arusha. It does get a bit bumpy in the afternoons, purely because it's flying over a lot of crater lakes, uh, a lot of the escarpment. Um, so it can get a little bit bumpy, but fantastic views, really absolutely stunning views. So what next? What do they do at the end of a safari? A um, couple of options. Um, Sadani National Park is, uh, is a great option. As I said at the very beginning, this is uh, where the Salu, the Azora Salu and Sadani Safari Lodge have got together for a, a great special offer. So this is where Sadani is located, as you can see, right on the Tanzanian mainland, but opposite Zanzibar, so overlooking the Indian Ocean. Two properties that Sanctuary have in that area. The first is the Safari Lodge, which is, as I said, on the beach, but you've got the National Park behind it. We have seen lions on the beach as well, which I think is a fantastic uh, image to, to have and a, a incredibly unique in, in our part of the world. Relatively simple design. Um, this is a great for people to relax, unwind, you know, spend some time going through the pictures that they've taken, relieve the stories that they uh, that they that they heard that they um, that they saw and, and, and talked about on um, on their safari. So a great opportunity to sort of relax, unwind before they head back home. And then further upstream on the Wami River which uh, is about a, a mile and a half away from the Safari Lodge, is the Sudani River Lodge. Slightly more luxurious property than the, the Safari Lodge. Great options to have here. There's a lot of mangrove swamps in the area, so they can go out on, on boats on the lake. Um, and also, if they're staying at River Lodge or Safari Lodge, they can take a dow trip across to Zanzibar itself. Um, and have a little stone town tour of Zanzibar, which is fantastic. So that's a that's a whole day trip. <clears throat> While we're here, I just want to really mention about the Kilimanjaro climbing operation that we have in in Tanzania because it is it is world class. It is absolutely fantastic. We're very very proud of it, um, and and I think a lot of people are still unaware of just how uh, how impressive our Kilimanjaro climbing operation is. We generally use the Machame route, um, which is the least frequented route of the six on Kilimanjaro. The main one um, is the Morango route. It's a little bit shorter, but it's nicknamed is the Coca-Cola route. Just so everybody's aware, 30,000 people attempt to climb Mount Kilimanjaro every single year. We provide three and a half hot meals every single day. You know, when you're up at uh, 17,000 feet, there is nothing like a warm bed and hot food. And then all our porters undergo incredibly stringent emergency t training. Um, it's never a good time to have any issues anywhere in East Africa. Um, and the worst place you could possibly have any problems um, is on Mount Kilimanjaro. So our, emo our, our Porters are all trained in, in the emergency evacuation, and, and our guides are absolutely uh, um, top-notch on what needs to be done and, and how to avoid it more than anything else. The best thing to do in, uh, with an emergency is actually to avoid it. And we're very proud to have a 97% success rate of getting people to the summit and, of course, back down. Um, just to put that into perspective, the average for everybody else is between 55 and 65% success rate. A number of reasons why we have that. Three and a half hot meals a day, of course, is part of that. Um, quality of equipment. This is one of our mess tents. Uh, we take a full mess tent up there. Um, what other, other companies do is they'll take a, a small mess tent that you, know, you can eat on a rotational basis, and then that mess tent becomes the porter's overnight accommodation. Um, we take our own accommodation for our porters so they can go to bed whenever they want rather than having to wait for clients to um, to get out of uh, out of the mess area. Please don't think this image is of anybody who's um, actually in an emergency situation. This is part of our training. Uh, as you can see, the training doesn't take place um, at lower altitude. It takes place 
on the mountain. Porters need to know what they're doing on the mountain itself. Guiding is vital <clears throat> anywhere in East Africa, or when, anywhere in, um, on safari, in fact, uh, but none more so than on Kilimanjaro. So these are Dismas and Orca, our two senior guides. Uh, they've summited Kilimanjaro, I think it's about 100 and something times between them. They're both incredibly knowledgeable. Um, again, you know, we've got people, our guides are actually often helping other clients, guides um, who have never summited Kilimanjaro. So they're taking, you know, they happen to explain the health and safety tips to other people who've never, never, who are guiding other groups. So they're fantastic guides and we're very, very proud of, um, very proud of them. Um, we have two different levels. We have the VIP level and the luxury level. Just to break it down into sort of uh, bits and pieces, the VIP, we take six plus, depending on, on how many people in the group, but between, uh, more than six porters per person. And that's because they're carrying more food, bigger tents, their own tents. Where, uh, and we're also part of the Porters uh, Welfare Association, who, and we make sure uh, the porters do not carry anything more than 44 pounds on their backs whereas a lot of other, uh, other companies will um, load their porters up just because they save money on that. Um, so you can see the differences between there. Please don't underestimate the value of sleeping on a cot on Kilimanjaro. Um, it's not quite like the same as sleeping on, on, on the floor. You want, you've got to be well rested when you're, uh, um, when you're climbing the mountain. And also we take a portable toilet. Um, not everybody does that. So they have to share the facilities. Um, which are not always of the highest standard. So we take our own, our own facilities up the mountain. And just an image of, uh, of, of the highest point in Africa, something that we can, all, um, we can all strive to. And just in case you, you don't really believe that we can do this, this is proof enough. This is a fan trip we did for travel agents out of North America and Mexico in 2011, and they all made it to the summit. If that's not proof of our abilities, I don't know what is and then i wanted to end with zanzibar very very quickly zanzibar is a couple of hours from arusha um, there's a lot of different things on zanzibar spice tour through stone town the blue safari which is whale watching and turtle watching sunset cruises and the night food market in stone town which happens every single day and has some amazing seafood absolutely stunning fresh as fresh can be I didn't want to go spend too much time on properties now. So if anybody has their questions, I'll be winding up shortly. You'll all be pleased to hear. But if anybody has any questions, please type them in now, and I will get to them in a couple of minutes. My absolute favorite property, and I will be taking my family to Barraza this December, which I'm very delighted to say. Um, they've got fantastic uh, property. What I love about Barraza, apart from the rooms, because they're all individual, they'll have their own plunge pools, the beds are so comfortable. Um, what I love that is they're so thoughtful about their public areas, and they actually have three different restaurants that they rotate around um, on, on a daily basis. So you always feel like you're eating in a different resort, which I think is fantastic. Right on the northern part of Zanzibar, Raz um, it's very well known, been around for a while, um, great property. And then the Eskzali, relatively new, again in the northern part of Zanzibar, quite large. No real beach there for this property. So if you do have clients going to Zanzibar, be a bit careful. Um, just to put it into perspective, there are 257 properties on Zanzibar. 65% of them cater primarily for Italian tourists, and not all of them have the picture postcard white sandy beaches that people are expecting from Zanzibar. So please do let us know um, if you've got a Zanzibar option for clients. We are able to help you out. There is a lot of not very nice properties out there. Um, and we do regular fan trips, so we are well aware of them. Now, it's almost done for me to stop talking, so I am going to get to questions. If anybody has questions, please type them in now. Um, very quickly, first question, what activities are there on Zanzibar? There's quite a lot to do. There's a lot of shopping in Stone Town. They can do the Spice Tour. Zanzibar has really become known as a, as a sort of a trading point for spices. They grow a lot on the island itself but they also um, uh, sort of act as the trading post. And I think that's a bit of a leftover from the days when Zanzibar was one of the major slave trading um, uh, ports. In fact, they used to have a massive slave auction um, in Stone Town. And as part of your Stone Town tour, you can still see 
the areas that they have the um, they have the, the auctions um, it's sort of quite um, uh, sobering really because they have uh, these huge metal rings that are that are cemented into the um, into the stonework around the various around these sort of open areas um, yeah it's quite a, it's quite, it, it, it's interesting but also a little bit harrowing in in, in certain respects um, then there's this, what we call the blue safari, which is whale watching. So you go out, out on a dow, you whale, do the whale watching. Don't always see the whales, um, but it's a fantastic trip out there, especially if you take a few, uh, a few cold drinks with you. Um, have, a great, uh, have a great time. <clears throat> and then, we, um, uh, then there's, I didn't write it on the, um, on the slide, but there's also the Zanzibar red collarless monkey. It's the only place in the world that this, this monkey is found. And what's special about the colobus is they actually only have four fingers. They don't have an opposable thumb. So uh, an interesting uh, little, little factoid. And they can walk through that, that area, and they can sort of combine that with uh, where the, some of the spices are grown. They grow a lot of clove, um, cloves in, in, in Zanzibar. Um, I hope that's answered the question. Right, questions are coming in thick and fast. Let's go. Um, how long is the recommended length for a safari? Well, if you're using AK six weeks, um, but in all seriousness, um, it depends on the clients. I would like to say a minimum of eight nights, nine nights, bearing in mind they'll have definitely one night in Arusha um, when they arrive, purely because of the flight network that um, most flights arrive of an evening. Um, so in, into Arusha, and then you can do two nights Tarangiri, two nights Ngorogoro Crater. You really need to do three nights Serengeti if at all possible. Um, so that's uh, that's your eight nights as a, as a minimum, as a minimum. Um, I find a lot of people from North America and South America are going to want to combine with Kenya or Uganda as well. So that, of course, would increase the length of time. But I would say a minimum of eight nights, but nine, ten is a little bit better. Spend a little bit more time on the in, in sort of iconic areas. You're, you're in Gorogo Crater you're, um, uh, and your Serengeti. Um, tetsi flies. What do you tell them to advise them on the time of travel to minimise tetsi flies? Um, avoid the rainy seasons, which is April May, which most properties in the in Tarangiri are closed anyway, um, and then parts of November. But just I would say November is low season. You can be lucky, um, you can get there and there's no tetsi flies at all. Um, it really depends on the rains. I would have the biggest best piece of advice I could tell you is um, if you wear lighter clothing. Um, tetsi flies seem to be um, attracted to dark blue and black primarily so wear lighter clothing um, if you can what's the best period to visit Lake Manyara Lake Manyara is a pretty decent um, destination year round but for me in the drier times so January February March June July August uh, September can get a bit of rain but we're not talking huge amounts because as it dries um, the lake level drops and the um, the pH of the lake gets much more alkaline, which attracts the uh, which creates an algae which attracts the flamingos. Um, <clears throat> so I would say that's probably the best time to visit Lake Munyara. Um, Weber Lodge, also by the Copy Rocks, like Cusini, very very similar, um, not on the same copy at all. Um, but they're in similar air. They're in similar. They're not in similar areas at all because it's actually quite a big distance between them. But they have similar ideas that they have these sort of amazing views. Whereas the um, Cusini is located on a copy, which is sort of a, a small area of rocks. Whereas Weber is located on a more of an escarpment, so it has, it's much higher up. I hope that answers your question. Um, I've been asked here a question about air. Um, we on the DMC side we don't, but we do have um, we, we do contract air through our Downers Grove office. Um, and I will happily, if you go through our website or um, yeah, no, go through the website is probably the best thing um, is the best thing to do. Um, to, to, to contact them. If you want any other contact details, your sales director or send me a private message and I will happily, happily um, pass you over to somebody else. 
I've been asked a question about Ebola, which I was surprised it's taken this long to come about. Um, at the moment, Kenya, Tanzania have no Ebola cases whatsoever. Um, there's a lot of options being put in place, a lot of things being put in place at the airports um, <coughs> to prevent um, anybody coming in with Ebola. Uh, they're screening everybody with temperatures, like similar to the um, Far East they did with uh, uh, with SARS. So they're screen, sc remotely screening people for, for body temperature. Um, the good thing we have within East Africa is it's not a destination that West Africans travel to. Um, they generally fly through Europe. Um, so we actually don't have too much contact with um, with West Africans. Uh, look, Ebola is a big issue at the moment and it's causing a lot of grief for a lot of people. Um, I think we're in a I think we're in a we're in a lucky um, a lucky situation where we don't have Ebola cases at the moment, and I know certain parts of Europe and um, and unfortunately the U.S. does as well. So uh, I'm happy to talk to clients if they are have any concerns. I'm happy to talk to clients. I live here. Um, I've got three young kids that are all under under six years old. Um, if there was any concerns for their safety, then I, of course I wouldn't be here. But I am. Um, I've been asked a question about the game viewing around Weber. It is actually very good. It's not just around January, February, March, uh, where it's fantastic, but other parts of the year. They do have some fresh water, which of course means that they're, uh, um, they're, they're always going to have uh, attract, um, attract animals. And I think what I like about it is purely because it, it was a, an old hunting concession. Um, so a lot of the game in other parts of that area have all moved into, um, into the conservancy um, because they're safe there. So the game viewing is actually pretty decent um, in, in Weber as well. Um, so yeah. Um, somebody asked about a map of the migration pattern and the properties combined. Um, we will get that to you. I've been asked. <clears throat> Are there any packages available in December? Of course, absolutely. We can create anything, uh, anything you want. If you're looking for a group tour, then our um, USA office on www.abercrombiekent.com um, has a lot of our brochure series, and they have some. They do have some of their uh, their tours for December. So yes, um, I December is a, is a tricky one. I would sort of the first half of December is um, can be is considered low season if you like um, which I actually like because you get sort of seem to get the animals a little bit more to yourself rather than uh, than sharing them with them um, with other people there is a small opportunity of rain but you know that when the rain comes it doesn't come like the Indian monsoon um, it rains it keeps the dust down it sort of gets the grass nice and fresh um, so I like that so yes for me in December is a good time January, February, March, the prices in Tanzania go crazy. Um, so December is a great sort of shoulder time to get the most um, uh, to get the most out of um, um, the most out of safari. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think that's it for questions. But if you do have any more questions, please type them in now. I'm a bit conscious of hogging so much of your very valuable time. So um, do please let me know if anybody has any questions at all. And as I said, we will be doing, we're making the presentation available to you. Um, and we will have to do another, um, another presentation covering Southern Africa. Not Southern Africa. What am I talking about? Southern Tanzania. So our salah, salu and ruaha. Um, June to September, still a good time to travel June to September. Yes, no, June to September is a fantastic time. Um, I would stick to the northern part of Serengeti at that time because the migration is bouncing between Kenya and Tanzania. So definitely, yes, it's peak, peak season. Um, getting space in July next year is, is already a struggle. Um, you know, there are properties also taking bookings for 2016. So June, July, August, September is peak peak season, same as January, February, March. So yes, a fantastic time. Um, does the migration within the Serengeti span several weeks? Uh, technically, no. It actually spans several months. 
um, because it's moving constantly between the sort of northern Serengeti down the, the eastern side through the south and then back up again through the western side. It's there for oh, nine, nine months of the year at least. Um, so plan the time. When do the clients want to travel? Bearing in mind the key, key times, January, February, March in the southern Serengeti and then June, July, August, September, October in the northern part of Serengeti. Um, yes, March would be close to the equator, but also it never really gets as far as going into the crater. So you don't have herds of wildebeest going through the crater. You get a few, but not the thousands and hundreds of thousands that you would see around Sanctuary Cassini um, at that time. Um, we need to be a bit careful. End of March, um, the rain, the, what we call the grass rains do come in. Um, but as I said, you know, the rains come in and it's, um, it sort of keeps the, the dust down and um, really makes things very, very green. I mean, it's stunning. It can be as green as, as certain parts of Europe as, um, at all. Any more questions? If that's it, then have a very, very good day. Have a very productive day. Um, and <clears throat> I would uh, look forward to talking to you again. We've got another one with, which is focusing on, on Kenya. Um, and, you know, we've got another series of webinars uh, based on product across East Africa and also updates on East Africa. So if there's anything that you feel that you need me to do or you want a, a specific presentation for your team, then please give us a shout. We're always happy to accommodate. If there's anything else, please type in any questions you've got. If not, that's it for me, guys. Thank you so much. I've been talking for well over an hour, so I really appreciate all your time and, and, and patience with me. Um, and if there is anything else, please, you can send me a email. I'm typing my email into the chat box now. It is jr, JR Turner at abercrombiekent.co.ke. I'll make sure I spelled that right because that would be embarrassing. So if there's any emails, anybody wants to send anything to me, please give me a shout. Very happy to answer. There's a couple of people I will get back to on um, some slightly more specific questions. And uh, look, guys, we look forward to seeing you, but also your clients in Tanzania in the ne in the future. If that's it, thank you all very much indeed. It's been an absolute pleasure. And we will hopefully catch up face-to-face -face at some point in the future. Thank you.